So good evening, everybody. Can everybody hear me, or is this too loud? Or it's okay. It's okay. So I just have to adjust my position then. Is this better? So welcome, everybody, on behalf of the Deutsche Religious Forum. Um, those of you might expect either for Dr. Hombrich or Dr. Anger doing the introduction. Frau Dr. Hombrich is suffering from a femoral neck fracture. I had to look up this word, this Oberschenkel Halsbruch, <laughs> um, which occurred to her three weeks ago. But the operation went well. She's making a lot of progress, and those who know her can imagine her being very optimistic and energetic as usual. I saw her in hospital, and she sends her regards to all of you and wish to be here. Dr. Anna has got other obligations tonight and also says hello. And for those, for those who don't know me yet, um, my name is Karen Thorsen. I'm the second chairwoman of our association or society. And my main job is teaching English at the second largest school in Schleswig-Holstein, the RWZ Wirtschaft in Kiel. And this is also the place where I met Stuart. Stuart Hoskinson, you have to get used to this. <laughs> Stuart Hoskinson, um, our guest speaker for tonight, because he had applied to do work experience at our school. He joined me at my classes for a couple of weeks, and we all enjoyed him being at our school. But how come that he lives in Kiel and wants to do work experience at a school? He was asked by a friend to accompany him on a trip to Kiel in October 2009, so almost two years ago, and he must have fallen in love with Kiel, because he simply stayed on. He comes from an interesting part of England, so he'll firstly talk about his hometown and its history. He'll then go on to talk about his experiences in Germany and some of the surprising little differences that he noticed. I'm curious myself, and I'm looking forward to the presentation, and I'm sure that we're all going to enjoy it. And now the floor is yours, Stuart. Hi, everybody. I'm very nervous, so please have some patience for me. I'm not going to do the usual actor's trick of imagining everybody naked. <laughs> I think most of you understood that by the sound of it. <laughs> yes, I'm Stuart Hodgkinson. I'm 30 years old and I come from England. Um, I come from uh, Leicestershire. I'll show you where Leicestershire is. As you can see, it's slightly north and slightly east of Birmingham. I'm sure that everybody knows Birmingham. And about halfway between Birmingham and Leicestershire is Coventry, which everybody will know, of course, because Coventry is twinned with Keel. Um, Leicester, like all cities, really, all major cities, was built around a river, the River Saw, in this case. And this is Leicestershire. You can see the, the area in the middle is, is the uh, main town centre. That's, uh, that's Leicester in the middle. And where I, where I come from is very close to Market Bosworth. Market Bosworth is a very historical place in England, and um, something very big happened there that started a um, very um, significant period of our history. <clears throat> There's actually a Roman road that runs through Leicestershire from one end to the other. Uh, obviously, the Roman road itself is not there anymore because it would be over a thousand years old. It, it would be very, very old by now. But, um, but the, the pathway of the road has been kept, and there is still a very straight road that runs right through the, uh, the county of Leicestershire. Um, you might notice that uh, Leicestershire looks a little bit like the, the head of a fox. <laughs> well, it, lots of people think that it looks like the head of a fox, and for that reason, our, uh, our local football team, Leicester City Football Club, are called the Foxes. 
And also, um, this is going back a few years now, but at one time all of our bus services were run by uh, a company called the Midlands Fox. So, it does look like a fox. <laughs> <laughs> Living in the Midlands um, sometimes can present you with a little bit of an identity crisis uh, because those people who live in London and the South class as, as Northerners and those people who live in the North of England class as Southerners and we're neither, we're Midlanders. I'm very proud to be that. <laughs> Market Bosworth um, which is a small market town, uh, very close to the village that I come from, uh, is a great um, historical significance because of the Battle of Bosworth in 1485. The War of the Roses, which lasted from 1455 through to 1487, was... Um, uh, it started because um, a lot of people in high positions, a lot of lords in, in, in England at that time, felt that Henry IV, Henry V, and Henry VI weren't actually the rightful heirs to the throne. They should never have been kings. And the war of, you'll see here, um, it, it was a battle between two cousins, in fact. The House of uh, the House of York, which is represented by the White Rose, and the House of Lancaster, which is represented by the Red Rose. And these are the two people who wanted to be king: Richard III and Henry VII. They were both, in fact, uh, descendants of Edward III. So both of them, in effect, had a claim to the throne. Um, but they had to fight it out. And the, the last, the final battle uh, was in Market Bosworth in the year 1485 when Richard III was killed, supposedly with an arrow through his eye. Supposedly. I don't think that's been verified, however. Um, when Henry became king, after the Battle of Bosworth in 1485. Um, a little while later, to try to bring together the, the, the two houses, the House of Lancaster and the House of York, he actually married um, the, uh, the niece of Richard III here and created the Tudor Rose, which is a mixture of the White Rose and the Red Rose of, of the Houses of York and of Lancaster. Richard III, actually, we use um, just a, a little interesting point here. We use, um, we, we say in England, to remember the, the colours of the alphabet, we say Richard of York gave battle in vain. I don't know if anybody's heard that before. To be red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And that's where that, that, that phrase comes from. This is the, um, this is the family tree of, of the Tudor family. You'll see right at the top is Henry VII, who of course beat Richard III in the war uh, in the Battle of Bosworth in 1485, married to Elizabeth of York, who of course again was Richard III's niece. And there in the top corner is the I've got one of these things is the Tudor rose, which is a mixture of the the red rose and the white rose. This, of course, was a very um, interesting period of history in, in, uh, for, for, for British people because a lot happened during the, uh, during the Tudor reign. Um, Henry VII himself reigned for a, a long time. He had uh, several children, the, the eldest of whom was Arthur Tudor, who unfortunately died before his dad did, so he never became king. However, Henry VIII, did become king, and I'm sure everybody has heard of Henry VIII with his six wives. Divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, 
survived. Or <laughs> outlived him. Some people say outlived him. She was the clever one. <laughs> mm. Henry VIII also created the, the Church of England because he wanted to divorce his first wife. Uh, the Pope wouldn't allow it. And so uh, Henry VIII uh, banned Catholicism in the UK and, uh, and created his own church, the Church of England, which he then, of course, became head of. And Queen Elizabeth II, our current queen, is, of course, the head of the Church of England now. So that's a tradition that has carried on for all of these years. Am I speaking too quickly? No, no. Oh, <laughs> After Henry VIII died, his, his, his son, uh, where's his son? Edward VI became king. He was known as the boy king or the child king because he became king at the age of nine, which no one would imagine these days. Um, he died at the age of 16, however. He was always a, a very sick child. Um, Henry VIII actually um, made, made it law that, that Edward would become king upon Henry's death. But then uh, if Edward didn't have any children, he wanted this lady down here, Lady Jane Grey, to become the queen. And she did for nine days. <laughs> now the reason, <laughs> the reason that Henry VIII decided that he wished um, Lady Jane Grey to be the Queen after Edward VI was because Lady Jane Grey was a Protestant. She belonged to the, Count, uh, to the Church of England. And his, other, his oldest daughter, Mary, who also became Queen, was a Catholic. And so Henry VIII wanted to avoid having a Catholic uh, ruler in the country again. However, his son, Edward VI, on his deathbed, as he was dying, he reversed that law and he decided that Mary should become the next queen. So what in fact happened was Lady Jane Grey became queen for nine days and then Mary had her beheaded. Mary was very well known for that. Mary's nickname, she's actually very well known as Bloody Mary. And because she killed a lot of people, she had a lot of people beheaded. And mainly for religious reasons. She, as I said, was a Catholic at a time when the whole of England was Church of England, was Protestant. And so she tried to reverse everything that her father and that her brother had done. And after Mary, of course, there came Elizabeth I. And that was a very, very prosperous period of our history. Um, we had the, uh, she went to war against Spain, uh, against King Philip II of Spain, and that was the time of the, the Spanish Armada. Um, during that time, she also encouraged um, the advancement of, of arts. Um, she was a, a very big fan of Shakespeare, for example, and went to see a lot of his plays at the Globe Theatre in London, and of course in Stratford-upon-Avon, uh, which is also in the Midlands. Um, also, uh, Francis Drake um, was very loyal to Queen Elizabeth I, and he uh, claimed new lands on behalf of England, and in fact the, the state of Virginia uh, is named after Elizabeth I because she was known as the Virgin Queen. So, Lady Jane Grey, she lived in Bradgate Park, which is also only a few miles away from where I live. And here, the, these are various pictures of Bradgate Park. Uh, here, these are the ruins of, of the house that she lived in with her husband, Earl Grey. 
I'm sure everybody has heard of the tea, Earl Grey, that's where it comes from. <laughs> so it's all very relevant. <laughs> Bradgate Park is actually an extinct volcano, strangely enough. You wouldn't imagine that there was ever a volcano in England, but yes, Bradgate Park is an extinct volcano, and so it is, it is very hilly, it's very, it has a lot of igneous rocks. It's also famous um, for, for peacocks. Uh, Lady Jane Grey and Earl Grey always had peacocks in their courtyard as pets. And to this very day, there are still peacocks at Bradgate Park. It's also very famous for its deer and other wildlife like snakes, for example. There are a lot of snakes because, uh, because of the, um, the terrain there. Uh, there's a lot of bracken, a lot of undergrowth, a lot of uh, very thick bushes that the snakes like to live in. So I don't go there. <laughs> On the top of Bradgate Park, there is also, I don't have a picture of this unfortunately, but there is also a very old watchtower known, known locally as Old John. And there is also a, a compass. You can see the whole of Leicestershire and beyond uh, from, from the top of, of Bradgate Park. And there's a compass that points uh, the direction of all of many, many major cities in the world and how far they are away from, um, from Bradgate Park. Lady Jane Grey was actually the, the granddaughter of Henry VIII's sister. So she was, she was related, as you'll, as you'll see from, from here. Yeah, she was related. It's, it's debatable whether or not she, she had a, a real rightful uh, claim to the throne. <coughs> okay. So, thank <laughs> you. So, how did I end up in Kiel then? Well, in 2009, September, October 2009, that I wanted to leave England for a while. Um, that was because I wanted new experiences, I wanted to learn a new language, I wanted to, to see a new culture, I, I, I just wanted, wanted to get out there and do something. And the original plan was uh, for me to live in, um, in Amsterdam, in Holland, because I've been there a few times and I love the city. Um, a friend of mine who I've known since I was about four years old, roughly, um, asked me if I would come to Kiel with her for eight days, for a week to eight days, because she had uh, a boyfriend who, at the time, worked as a dancer on the, uh, the colour line ships. So, we came here so that she could spend some time with him. And then the plan after that was for us to go to, uh, to Amsterdam for a few days together. And then she would leave me there and that would be my life. And I thought Amsterdam would be relatively easy because everybody speaks English. Not, not just school English, but perfect English. And so I thought, that would be, I'll, I'll be able to do that. So now I'll slowly pick up Dutch as, as time goes on. But that never happened. I, um, I ended up staying in, in Kiel quite spontaneously. There was no rhyme or reason behind it at all, except for the fact that um, this was my first time in Germany. Um, I really didn't know what to expect. And I, I just found the people so friendly and a total... <laughs> yes, it was a, a total, um, total change to England and, and the way that people interact with each other in England. And I, I like the way that things run here. I like the way that, that everything is very efficient. Germans are very well known for being very efficient, and uh, yeah, that, that uh, appeals to my nature. Mm. So. 
Now I want to talk about a few of the very little things. They might seem like silly things um, that I found unusual about Germany that are very, very different to, to how things are in England. And the first thing that I noticed was penguins. No. not payments. <laughs> Crossing the road. Uh, in England, it's common practice to cross the road when there's a gap in the traffic. <laughs> Simple as that. And so, so that's what I did when I first got here. And these lines of people against the side of the road looked at me. Uh, <laughs> Such shock as though I'd just kicked a dog in the street or something. <laughs> and it really was only a week or two later um, when I, I was out and about with friends that um, I crossed the road and somebody yelled, No, don't, there's a policeman just there. And I found out that it's actually illegal to cross the road when, when the lift van's red and not green. <laughs> and you can get fined. So. That was, that was a bit of a culture shock to me. Um, I'm getting used to it now, but um, I think that's, 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 a, that's a cultural thing too. My, I had a German teacher in England who I visited uh, last week who said that even now, she's, she's lived in England for at least 30 years, perhaps a little more, but even now she still has that within herself that, that, that she only crosses the road when the little green man is showing. So, so that's crossing the road. <laughs> so what's are English people famous for? <laughs> for queuing. That's right. Now, if you go to a country like Spain, of course it's total, total mayhem at a, at a bus stop, for example, or any of the places where you would expect to have to queue. Everybody just crowds round and tries to shove their way onto to the front. In Germany, it's not quite the same, although it's nowhere near as strict the etiquette is nowhere near as strict as it is in England. English people will quite happily, I wouldn't say happily, <laughs> they will queue <laughs> for hours and hours and hours, but it has to be done properly. That's single file, one after the other. Now, if somebody does queue jump, then people won't say anything. There's, there's a, a very famous, famous English thing that, 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 that people do. They'll, they'll stand and, and tut and shake their head. And that, that's very English, very, very English. Nobody complains. All they do is stand and tut and shake their head. <laughs> so far, I've never seen that in Germany. Do people tut in Germany? No? It's very English people. Very English thing. We don't complain, but we do tut a lot. <laughs> now, what did I expect when I came to Germany? As I say, I've never been here before, so I didn't know what to expect. But we all, we all have um, an idea, a stereotype, if you like, of what you think people are going to be like. <laughs> and so... <laughs> So I was, I was expecting um, Leo Warzen and Diendl, and uh, of course, of course in Bavaria it's, it's quite possible that people do wear Leo Warzen and Diendl, but, but here up north people tend not to, I found, unless you go to, unless you go to Das Piet's house on Europaplatz, yeah, that's a traditional Bavarian place, and so that is in fact the first place that I ate when I came here. And so the first, the first working woman I saw was wearing a dim. 
So that didn't do anything to quash the stereotype. <laughs> English people expect that Germans eat a lot of sausages, and that is one of the stereotypes that is true. <laughs> Very much so. <laughs> Unfortunately, I haven't tried a German sausage yet because I'm vegetarian. But <laughs> Another thing that, uh, that British people think, or certainly I do, uh, I did rather, is that the punk movement was, was very, very popular in Germany. Um, I've not been to Berlin yet, so I do hope to go. I, I presume that there is still quite a, a large <coughs> punk following in, in Berlin. That's something that I'll perhaps find out later. However, you do, I have seen lots of people um, with uh, lots of uh, people dressed up as punks in, in Kiel, and it seems to be a perfectly normal thing here. Um, in, in England, people would certainly stare at you and look at you. There's, there, there is um, an aspect of England that, that, that expects people really to conform to the norm, whereas in Germany, it's not so much. I think people are far more accepting of people here. And the other thing, everybody in England thinks that, uh, that German people are all fans of David Hasselhoff. <laughs> Now, I know he does have a following here. We, um, I don't know whether it's still running, but there used to be a, a TV program in England called Eurotrash. And it was uh, presented by two French men. And this, this, this TV program was always on very, very late at night. And um, it, it um, ridiculed, so to speak, but in a nice way, it ridiculed um, people from other countries who do things that are not British at all. And so, through that programme, you, you, I got a lot of, uh, I, I, had, I formed a lot of views of what I might expect in Germany. And one of those things was that you would all be fans of David Hasselhoff. <laughs> Is that not true? <laughs> Awful. <laughs> anyway, we all have to make a living, don't we? <laughs> when I first arrived in Germany, um, we hadn't booked a hotel room. We decided that it would probably work out better if we just um, turned up in Kiel and went to the hotels and booked a, a room last minute because I, I was a hotel manager in England. I also had pubs. And I was I, I knew of course that last minute rooms can often be cheaper than booking it online. And so we had to uh, book a hotel room. Uh, but we wanted a twin room. Now a twin room is a room with two single beds that are separated. You don't have that in Germany. You have single rooms and double rooms. And the beds are different. The beds are very different, in fact. That's, that's a German bed. That's an English or American bed. We call that, well, in, in Germany, I've heard you call that a, a Französisch bed? Yeah. French bed. French bread, uh, French bread. French bread. <laughs> <laughs> I made a mistake. You don't have to get closer to the microphone. I made a mistake as well. You can all hear you. You just have stage to stand up. So yeah, it's more comfortable for you. I made a mistake as well. Good. <laughs> so yes, <clears throat> this is the kind of bed that, that I was expecting to find in Germany. Like I say, these are only small things, but when you add them all up together, it makes one big thing, really. Um, so we were trying to find a hotel room with, with, with twin beds, and we ended up taking a, a double room because that was all that was available. But, of course, a double room means two separate beds, and you can actually separate them, so... I found that a little, little different. <laughs> yeah. 
Also, when, when you're buying a bed, um, it's, it's very different too, because in, in, in England, you would buy a base and a mattress. Simple as that. The base always has a solid top, and the mattress always has several layers, the same, the same as in Germany, but the middle layer is always springs. In Germany, of course, it's, um, it's three different parts. You have the base, and then you have a Lattenwurst. And that's where you get the spring from. So when I went to Ikea to buy a bed, and I, I, I budgeted for this, I found that my mattress was just going to fall through a hole. <laughs> I hadn't accounted for having to buy a Latin horse. <laughs> yes, so, thank you, Jeremy. <laughs> Pillows are different as well. It's, it's not just the bed, it's also pillows. In, in England, pillows are always long and, and, and solid. Uh, they, are quite, they are solid, that's very true. That's very true, actually. I, I, I was in England last week um, visiting my parents and I'm now used to German pillows. And so to sleep on pillows at my home in, in England, um, well, I couldn't. It was like sleeping on a stone. <laughs> yes, they are softer here, but they're also a different shape. Um, in, in Germany, they're big and they're square. In England, they are, they're long and they're, they're narrow and hard. <laughs> so beds are different here. Socialising in Germany is, is also very different to England. Um, I was staying at the Basic Hotel on... Um, La Naraya, yeah, I don't know if anybody knows it. But just around the corner from there, there's a, a very nice little pub opposite the um, Sparkasse Marina uh, called uh, Ratzburg. Yeah. I have a very knowledgeable gentleman here who knows all the pubs in here. <laughs> and I, I noticed there that very unlike England, age groups tend to mix and have fun together and drink together. I think um, some of that is also down to um, Schlagermusik, I think. Because Schlagermusik appeals to all ages in Germany. And so if a particular hit is played, then people young and old will all get up to dance with each other. Um, in England, young people don't tend to mix with old people in a club. Um, I, I'm 30 and I'm already 10 years too old to go to a nightclub in England. Um, <laughs> it's true. People start going to nightclubs when they're 17 in England and they, they tend to stop at when, when they get too old for it, which is 19 or 20 years old. Also, we, we have a habit, I'm doing it again, we have a habit in England, we have a very big problem with, with binge drinking. Uh, I don't know if everybody understands binge drinking? Yes. Binge drinking is, um, is drinking... Excessive amounts, that's right, yes. What people tend to do in England is they will work all week in a job that they hate and they live <laughs> They live for the weekend. It's as simple as that. They live for the weekend. This is, this is quite common in England. It's, you might hear David Cameron speaking about a broken society. Well, to an extent, it, it, it is really in England. And yes, people, a lot of people do live for the weekend in England. And they'll go out at the weekend and they will drink so much alcohol that they end up lying in the streets, they end up fighting. It's, um, it's, it's not nice to be in a city centre at 2am on a Friday or a Saturday in England because that's when the clubs close, and that's when all the, the young people come out. Everybody's trying to get a taxi at the same time, so there are problems with that. 
Um, everybody is, is, is very, very drunk, and, and English people do like to fight when they're drunk, unfortunately. Uh, I'm not one of them, but, but, it, but it happens, and yeah, I've not seen that in Germany, quite fortunately. I have seen, um, I've seen one thing that would never have happened in England, I thought it was fantastic. I saw two young men walk by me. One, it was very, very late at night. They were both very, very drunk. And one of them, they, they must have been about 18 or 19 years old. But one of them uh, tipped over a skip, uh, a skip, moved on that, yeah. Tipped over a skip. And the other one went crazy at this, this young man and demanded that he pick the skip back up again, yeah? And then he, he threw this lad to the ground and really, um, really had a go at him, was very, very angry with him. And that, um, that to me shows the German sense of responsibility and the German, German sense of togetherness. The, I think some people don't agree with me, but this is what I've noticed. It's nice. I, I like the way that, that there are aspects of socialism still in Germany that, that, that disappeared long ago in England, unfortunately. So, um, Straßenfest also. Um, that's a picture there of Straßenfest somewhere in Germany. Um, they, of course, don't happen in England, and one of the reasons that they can't happen in England is because of um, alcohol licensing law. Um, this was another big culture shock to me, um, to see people drinking alcohol in the streets in Germany, because in England you won't see that, that's illegal, and, and so that doesn't happen. And obviously, at a Straßenfest, you, you need to be able to have a beer, really, or a cocktail. And that, that's, that's why they're not, so, um, they're not so popular in England. Um, another thing that I noticed about, uh, with, to do with socialising is the, is the cafe culture here in Kiel. In Kiel, we have very, very, very similar weather to England. Very similar. It rains a lot, it gets cold, and sometimes we have nice days, sometimes we don't. And also, in, in one day, you can have every single type of weather. And English people don't like that. <laughs> I don't think anybody likes that, but it doesn't stop people in Kiel from sitting sitting outside in a cafe, which, which I find fantastic. You, you don't, in, in certain cities in England, you will see cafes with, uh, with tables outside, but it's not as common as it is here in Germany. So that, that gives the town a nice feel, I think. Um, smoking. In, in, in pubs and restaurants, of course, is, is different in Germany to in England because several, a few years ago, uh, smoking was banned in, in all public buildings in, in the UK and that included all pubs. And the law says that you have to be 10 metres away from a public building to smoke. It sounds ridiculous. Um, th there are good points and bad points about it. There are good points and bad points. Um, it's good if you are a smoker and you want to give up, because everybody knows that if, if you want to stop smoking, the worst thing you can do is go to a pub and have a beer, because that's when you want a cigarette. Um, yeah. But in Germany, of course, um, you can smoke more or less wherever you like. And, uh, Mm, I think you can, more or less. I think it's, it's certainly nowhere near as strict as, as England. In, in England, you feel like a social pariah. How would you say social pariah in German? Pariah. Oh, yeah. Pariah. You feel like a social pariah in England if, if you smoke. In Germany, it's, it's pretty much accepted, I find. Certainly in Kiel. I think it is. <laughs> We can discuss this later. There will be time for questions. <clears throat>
So beer and wine and alcohol and spirits. Um, an English pub is very different to a German pub. Um, you First of all, you order everything at the bar, you, you pay and you take your drinks away with you. In Germany, of course, you find a seat, you sit down and somebody serves you. That's nice. I like that. <laughs> I like that. And because of that setup, the bar is also very different. If, if you go to an English bar, um, there will be displays on the back. There will be fridges with, with glass fronts full of Alco Pops. Do we know Alco Pops? Yeah. Basically, it's a huge industry in England, the, uh, the Alco Pop industry, uh, with, with companies like Smirnoff making Smirnoff Ice. They sell millions and millions of bottles of that every weekend. Bacardi uh, have a huge range as well, and various other, other companies have huge ranges of alcohol pops in, in England. Um, and you don't tend to find them over here. Um, yeah, you, you, I think you can find them in shops. But, Not quite as popular. No, you can find them in shops, of course, but if you go to any bar in England, any pub in England, they will have fridges full of different alcohol pops. And obviously, you, you don't find that over here. So, and rather than having displays on the bar, they, you tend to have, um, tend to have um, menus, drinks menus on the tables, of course, over here. So it's, it's very different. Um, every every English pub will have a selection of uh, beer of, of lagers and um, and bitters uh, from from the barrel, and that's very different in England. We don't we don't have the German purity laws for one thing. So in Germany, you're only allowed to have four ingredients in beer. In England, you can have as many as you like. <laughs> so lager. Um, which is uh, which always has gas in it. Also contains a lot of chemicals, so it's not nice to drink. However, bitter, um, which has no gas in it whatsoever, it's a it's a living, breathing product that, that has to be vented. It has to be allowed to breathe. Um, that's that's a completely different thing. That's a very pure kind of beer, and it's very different to. To what you find in Germany, because of course we don't have Hefeweizen in England, so that's not good. <laughs> um, I found that, that um, people uh, make strange mixtures of drinks in Germany. So they're strange to me. Spitzi, for example. <laughs> Totally over my head when I first came here. Orange, orange and cola together. But now I, I, I drink it because I like it now. But when when I first came here, that was just odd to me, just strange. And and the things that people put in beer as well. For example, banana in Hefeweizen. That, that, it's very common. Or even cherry in Hefeweizen. Very, very common to do that. Um, no, in, in England, you would perhaps um, put lime cordial, perhaps lime cordial or black currant cordial, um, in, which is a very concentrated uh, syrup in, in lager. But other than that, uh, of course, we have what's called sh uh, shandy, which you call uh, radler or alista, alstavasa. We have that, of course, but we, we would never mix beer with cola. <laughs> People do that. It's also um, there's also a difference with uh, with bottled water. Uh, because what would be called no normal in, in England is, um, is still water. Whereas over here, if somebody asks for a water and they're asked middle, middle water water, they would say normal, and normal would mean with, with, uh, with carbon dioxide, which is another difference, only a little one. So food. <laughs> 
Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's quite a, a, a traditional German dish there with, with meat, sauerkraut, and knudel. Quite a traditional German food. No, no, no. Knudel, yeah, knudel is more Bavarian. Or, or, or Austrian. Yeah, okay. Okay. But I, I, would, I would say that that's a fairly traditional food here. Um, I would imagine that the majority of people in this room would think that the British national dish is fish and chips. But it's not. The most popular dish in England is curry. And we'll talk about that later. <laughs> um, as a person who doesn't eat meat, I find it slightly harder, personally, in Germany than in England, uh, because the, I, I find, personally, that, the, that there are more vegetarian options in England than in Germany. No? I'm, I'm obviously not going to the right places then. <laughs> Fortunately, I eat fish, which is good, being, being on the, on the Ost Sea. So. Um, what I really like about Germany is uh, the seasonality of food. How you have Spargel said, and everybody goes crazy for Spargel when it's in season, which I think is fantastic. And you have Grünkohl said, and everybody eats Grünkohl. You know, <laughs> in England, seasonality. Um, we haven't had seasonal food for many decades. We, we import from all over the world and you can get any kind of fruit and veg in any supermarket at any time of the year. But more often than not, the food it doesn't taste how it's supposed to because it's travelled from, from such a long, for such a long distance. You know, we, we get apples from New Zealand, which is just crazy because England is such a fertile land, you know, you would imagine that we would be able to produce enough apples for ourselves. But we still import a lot of food, and food is not so seasonal in England as it is in Germany. One thing that we do share, though, with seasonality is, of course, strawberries, which, uh, which we, of course, eat with, with cream, and, and Wimbledon is, is very famous for its, uh, for its strawberries. One thing that uh, an, uh, an English person is, is never going to like about Germany is, is uh, pickled fish, I have to say. <laughs> pickled fish. Um, like Matthias, for example. Matthias uh, and, um, and Bismarck Hering, things like that. An English person will, can never get used to that kind of food. It's, that's a very... Very Nordic thing. Are you English? I am, and I eat it. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, okay. Where, where are you from, may I ask? Lincolnshire. Lincolnshire? Ah, next bit. Yeah, right next to me. You're not from, you're not from Skeggy, are you? Oh, God. <laughs> Kippers. Kippers are smoked. So, mm, I like Kippers. Actually, yeah, kippers these days tend to be painted with painted with a with an artificial smoke these days. But if you go to the right place, you can get proper smoked kippers, and they're nice. But I don't. <laughs> ID and paperwork, Mr. Tony Blair. Uh, I, I believe that this was actually an anti a uh, campaign against the identity. That, that Tony Blair tried to introduce because there is a, a fingerprint in blood there. <laughs> in, England is, is very much a, um, a, a, a parental society. Uh, there are cameras everywhere. You can't really move without being caught on, on camera. And people have come to accept that, but the British people would never have never and could never accept having an identity card. They, they feel that it's an affront to their liberty somehow. It goes against their liberty. 
Um, in, in Germany, of course, you have to carry identification with you at all times, and because I don't have an identity card, excuse me, because I don't have an identity card, I have to carry my passport with me. That to me was a very big culture shock because I was always brought up um, in England to, um, to, to keep my passport in a safe place, locked away because of identity theft. And, and so to, to have to carry it around with me, to me, felt completely wrong. Of course, I'm used to it now, um, but I, I, I've heard that apparently if you don't have identification and you are stopped and asked, you, you're fined 200 euros or something like that. So, is that not quite right? You've got five days to hand it in. Oh, you have five days to hand it in, right, fair enough. I know. Okay. <laughs> oh, I see. Didn't <laughs> I got the t-shirt? Uh, that's not true at all. You, you are not obliged to carry any identification card with you. No, no, no. no. It's, uh, um, well, many people believe that, uh, but um, it's not true at all. And there was a lawyer in Germany who brought up a book um, that uh, contains a lot of um, well, these points that people believe. Uh, but that are not true. And one of these is that you have to carry with you an identity card. Well, um, my, I won't name my first place of work, but um, the first place that I worked at in, in Kiel here, um, we had the, the Tsol came in one day, and my boss hadn't informed me that I had to have my passport with me at all times, and so I didn't have it with me, and he was fined thousands of euros for that. So, I, I would always carry my identification with me, just on those grounds. So. If you learn, if you learn, learn um, it's called Ralf Höcker, um, Lexikon der Rechtsirrtümer. Okay. And there you will find it uh, that, well, this is one of uh, the points that many people um, think they are obliged uh, to, to obey to, but uh, it's, it's not true. All oh, right, okay. Nobody knows how it came up and uh, why everybody believes it. Maybe it's from uh, the um, well, period uh, before. Second World War or something, mm. but uh, after 1945, it's not uh, you are not obliged. Right. So it's a very it's a very grey area. Then I think we can conclude. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Yes, but, but, but that's a whole different. We're not talking about German, That could also be true. Yes, we will. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually going to go very, very quickly through the last few bits because we're, we're coming to the end of of the hour now, so um, I'll move on to multiculturalism. Um, multiculturalism, of course, we um, there are a lot of, of um, the, there are a lot of foreign people. I have to be careful how I phrase this. Um, living in Germany as well as in England, but uh, they're from different places, of course. Um, I, I said before that um, that uh, the curry is is the most popular dish in England. And that's because um, India was a colony of ours, and we, we had a mass migration of, of Indian people into England, and with, with that, of course, they brought their food. Um, I find that the Germans are generally more, more tolerant of, of people than, than the English. Maybe, maybe that's just me, but I've, I've found that I've been very well received in Germany, fortunately. <laughs> It's hard to get curry. It's hard to get a good curry here. It, it is, um, yes, it is. Um, they're, they're not very spicy, I find. <laughs> not very strong. 
In fact, in, in England, in, in virtually every village now, there is a chip shop and and a curry curry house in virtually every village in England now. That's that's quite normal. There's, there are also Chinese restaurants in virtually every village too, which I suppose would be different here in Germany. I wanted to move on to uh, renting an apartment. Again, I'll just go through this very, very quickly because I'm going over my time allotment here. Um, it's okay. Good. Um, the the description of a department of a department of an apartment is is very different in Germany to to in England. In England, you would be um, you would be told how many bedrooms a place has and how many bathrooms or half bathrooms. But that would be it. Um, in Germany, you're told how many rooms there are together and how many square meters you get. So that's very different. Also, the pricing is different as well because in, in England, well, in, in Germany rather, you, you get um, a Kalk meter and a Warm meter. Well, in England, it's simply a Kalk meter and then everything else you pay yourself. And you organise that through your own council and through your own um, utilities provider, your own electricity company, etc. Communication is something that we all take for granted. You um, just presume that you're able to, to communicate to people exactly what you're thinking, exactly what you're doing, exactly how you're feeling. And of course, in your own native language, everybody can do that fluently and, and very well. And so to come to a different country that uses a different language is a very, very difficult thing to do. And even, I've been here for nearly two years now, and I still find it very, very difficult. But my first six months here, I had a headache oh, constantly through having to concentrate so hard to, to understand everything. Um, English people are very, know, very well known for small talk, especially talking about things like the weather. That's, that's one of my favourite subjects, is the weather. And, and really that's just a way to, to break the ice and to keep a, a conversation going. Uh, the German language is, is far more direct, I find. Um, when I uh, first started working here, I found it difficult to come to terms with the fact that people didn't say, would you mind doing this please, etc, etc. There doesn't tend to be that um, same level of, of flowering up a sentence, if you understand what I mean. Um, German does tend to be very direct, so it tends to be matas, 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 it'll work, anyway. Whereas in England, of course, people would say, oh, would you just mind doing that? It's, it's, there is a, a degree of manipulation to the English language, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, small talk is, is something that you either like or you don't. I think a lot of, a lot of German people see it as, um, as not genuine. And it's probably not, to be honest with you, because it's talking about things that you're not necessarily interested in. But communication is very different between, uh, between Germans and between English people. Um, then there's formality and informality as well. Of course, in English, we only have one word for you. And in German, you have du, ihr, and sie. And um, I'm often referred to as Herr Hodgkinson. Um, now, in England, nobody, well, very few people would call me Mr. Hodgkinson. I would be, I would be still to virtually everybody, really. So, to, um, so it's very different to get used to that level of formality where people are calling me Z and people are calling me Herr Hodgkinson. Um, British humour is also very, very different to, to German humour. British, British humour tends to be quite black, I find, quite dark. It, it, people 
tend to put themselves down. They tend to um, be self-deprecating. Uh, but they also tend to put other people down as well, but, but only as part of a joke, I think, really. And um, I find that German people don't do that so much. Um, perhaps it's a defence mechanism for the British, I don't, I don't know. Perhaps it is. That's another thing we could perhaps debate later. <laughs> Last thing I wanted to talk about was um, was jobs and welfare and benefits. I don't know if any, does everybody understand this? It says that Social Security sent a picture and letter from the retired guy we support. Um, when you, of course, when you when you support an animal charity, you quite often get a picture of the animal that you're sponsoring. So this is a play, this is a play on that. This guy's paying his taxes and supporting this retired gentleman. That's what that is. <laughs> Taxation and private health care is very different in Germany. Um, in England, uh, it's, it's very centralised. Um, you, you pay your national insurance, which is about 12% from the employee. The employee. And that covers your, um, your sickness benefits, that covers um, any periods when you're out of work, that covers your health care, and that covers your, your pension. And of course in Germany you, you have to pri uh, sign up with a, a private company, for, but then um, you are probably better supported in Germany if you, if you do become sick. I know that I've had, um, I've had a few days off from work through illness and, and received a normal pay, whereas I've, I've never personally had that in England. So perhaps that's, that's a, a slight difference as well. Um, taxation's much higher in Germany than in England, though, uh, I find. <laughs> Taxes 20% in both com uh, in both countries, but of course, if you in, uh, include the the, um, the deductions of your, your health care, etc., that's another 20% on top of that. So it's you do get taxed quite heavily in Germany, I find. So. But then the cost of living here is lower, so it all swings and roundabouts, so we say. <laughs> um, with with jobs. Everybody receives very formal training in Germany. Um, you have uh, an Ausbildung system, so virtually every, every job that's, uh, that's, that's quite manual, um, you, you will have to first get a, an Ausbildung before um, you can earn decent money. Um, in England, our equivalent would be the GMVQ, which stands for uh, General National Vocational Qualification. Um, doesn't really match up to the German system, I have to say. Um, the, the German system, like I said, is, is very formal. But then also, it can be very rigid, I find. Um, because I, I work in hospitality, uh, which is gas, it has nothing to do with hospitals, it's uh, gastronomy in German. And uh, I find that um, in, in such a trade, um, your personality has to count as much as what you, as much as what you do. And when, of course, um, you, you've got an Ausbildung and everybody does everything in exactly the same way and it's very rigid, it doesn't give you much room uh, for, for personality. But then in other trades, I think that that works very well because everybody knows exactly what they're doing. It's very, very well organised. And, and so... And so the, <laughs> the German reputation for efficiency is, is upheld through that. So positives and negatives. Um, Again, at work, I, I just wanted to bring up the Zietzen thing again. It's, it, I find it very unusual in German for me to be referred to as Herr Hodgkinson or, or Zie, because in, in a workplace, I've always, especially in hospitality, in, 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 in 
restaurants and bars and hotels. Um, the the um, relationship between staff members tends to be a lot more informal. Um, I can see everybody's starting to get a little bit restless now, so I'm going to open up the floor to um, for, for questions. <coughs> I'm sure there'll be plenty. So thank you for listening. Interesting presentation, and I think we feel we feel partly flattered. Um, nobody knew that we could be so nice and get drunk in the middle of the night. I think, and um, we feel partly also we partly agree and disagree, maybe, or detect new sides of ourselves and of the British as well. So um, I think we do it like this: that um, people who have a question, they just stand up and and, and ask, and you just try to answer them, right? So. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.